Uh, welcome to lecture 4 uh, in the series uh, of risk assessment and LCA module in the course ecology and environment. In the last uh, 3 lectures we discussed various aspects of uh, health risk assessment um, and uh, the uh, pathways by which uh, contaminants can reach receptors and uh, cause health effects and so we looked at the linkages between different sources and different aspects of uh, our uh, uh, current uh, uh, society where we use different products and different processes. Uh, in this lecture, uh, we are going to look at uh, remediation, uh, soil and sediment and uh, some aspects related to health risk assessment related to this. Uh, in the last few lectures, we discussed water and air pollution. Here we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the third aspect of uh, control where we say remediation. It is not really control as the word says, remediation is uh, a treatment option something, some damage to the environment has already occurred, so we want to rectify it. So we look at uh, remediation first from a soil pollution perspective. So let us take this example in the schematic where uh, we have, uh, this is a soil uh, system. We have a small set of contamination here and from this there is a possibility of evaporation of this chemical through the soil to air and there is also a possibility of leaching uh, to the ground water. Uh, by dissolution. So if this kind of thing and we look at this particular scenario where there is this is occurring in a, in a perimeter of a, uh, a factory or some processing facility where there is nothing here, it is all open ground. So there is a possibility that exists, uh, we can do what is called as an ex situ option is we can remove the option that we have is that of removal of this entire contaminated zone. So we uh, take it out by excavation. And then there will be a gap here that will be filled up with any clean material or a filler or anything that we want to do and it is possible to do this, uh, I have shown it schematically here. So once we remove it, um, we have various options uh, that now we can uh, work with. So what do we do with the excavated material? So what we have now done is we have transferred the contamination from this area uh, to this mass of soil which something has to be done. and. Uh, uh, the different options that we have uh, for disposal of the excavated material. Um, we have to worry about it and think about it a little critically because this is now a new uh, waste material. It is not in its original form but it is still waste and new exposure pathways uh, can also form from here. So it is hazardous, it has a chemical that you do not want in the soil and therefore it can cause damage wherever it is. So um, where do you put it and one of the most common refrain one of the most common comment from people in uh, in our communities is it not in my backyard. So uh, this is a very common phrase in places uh, where remediation has been attempted is that where do you, if you dig up a large amount of contaminated soil in some area and where do you put it and so wherever you put it there is going to be some somebody who is not going to like it because of uh, these new exposure pathways. And so what can be done? So the op obvious option is in nobody's backyard. So nobody's backyard means we do not want to put it anywhere. So what do we do? So we put it, one option is to do what is called as a monitored uh, secure landfills. The word landfill is a, uh, is a generally loose used term where you put solid material into a pit in the ground and uh, uh, that is it. So the word secure here means that uh, it is now well designed such a way that it does not allow the usual exposure pathways and uh, therefore it is uh, contained. And uh, the other option is to treat the contaminated soil to remove the material from the soil and uh, clean the soil. So uh, monitored secure landfills uh, uh, schematically they look like this. So uh, this is the contaminated material, It is there is a hole that is dug in the ground and you have barriers that are placed on all the sides on both in the bottom sides and as well as in the top to prevent the top to prevent evaporations in the side and the bottom to prevent leaching because if there is uh, some chemical that is here and that chemical will release uh, if, the, if the container breaks usually it is secured in a container but if for some reason due to pressure or something it breaks it will still be contained inside this chamber. And uh, we have sensors both on the top and bottom to monitor if there has been any release. So uh, we look at uh, uh, leaching, uh, whenever it rains if there are leaks in this thing. So over a period of time what has been observed is that secure landfills uh, do have 
because they are uh, made by uh, made by us there are no absolutely fail safe materials they are always likely to uh, have some failure at some point in time how long in uh, in their usage time this will happen is a is the question that uh, people try to answer in landfill design and uh, it has to be monitored from time to time in order to so they have uh, strict barriers which does not allow leaching which means if the rains the rainfall is not allowed to percolate inside therefore it cannot uh, uh, leach any chemical now uh, despite all these protections people are still a bit uh, uh, not so trusting of monitored landfills but i think this is one way in which we can engineer a containment facility and this is done for a large amount of hazardous waste which we do not know how to treat uh, or we do not want to treat for economic reasons. The other option is to, uh, is to clean the soil. So, there is a contaminated soil it goes into a soil washing container and you add a solvent and uh, the this clean soil that comes out and it can be returned to the excavated site original site and this clean material goes back there. So, that you do not have to buy new material it is you clean it. So, you can treat it on site and put it back. So, uh, that is economically viable and uh, this spent solvent of course, now is a new waste it is a new waste stream and so this has to be treated and whatever technology is available for us to treat it uh, we have to use it. The question here is the choice of solvent that we use. Um, so, if you can look at it the analogy here is uh, similar to that of uh, washing clothes, washing machine some, something like that where uh, we are trying to remove dirt and oil and grime from clothes uh, we use a detergent. So, a solvent that uh, a very small amount of solvent that needs to be used so that we are minimizing the amount of uh, the mass of the solvent that contains the hazardous chemical. So, we are taking say thousands and thousands of cubic uh, meters of soil and then we are removing all that contaminant into a very small volume. So, uh, maybe a drum uh, maybe you can take 10,000 uh, meter cube of soil and contain all the uh, wash in maybe a 1000 liters. So, that is a, a very large reduction in uh, the volume of waste that you have to now manage uh, either store it and then this can be put it in a put in a landfill if you do not want to treat it and there are various options for treatment uh, that are available. The other scenario of soil remediation is in this kind of case where there is an oil pipeline that is running in the soil. So, this is, uh, this is a very common scenario, but on top of it we do not have an industrial setting we have residential or commercial buildings and therefore, excavation if there is a leak in the uh, from the pipeline uh, which is also uh, results in pathways of uh, exposure. Excavation is not possible because you have these buildings here which are residential or commercial they have been built and uh, this is uh, quite often this is a case and you cannot do anything about it. So, so one has to then devise uh, in situ options uh, where uh, you do not have to you everything is in place and treatment has is done in place. So, this is one of the examples of an in situ option that you pump the solvent in uh, through a network of pipelines here flush it across the uh, zone here and pull it out and this extract that is pulled out is a similar to the extract that comes from the soil washing container in the previous slide and then we have to treat the solvent. So, this this can be done uh, either on site or it can be taken and done it separately and elsewhere. So, in all this process there is uh, again a secondary risk that is posed because of these processes and uh, and the if you do not want to disturb the commercial and residential activity of these people living here then you have to take extra pains extra care to all the more take care of health risk assessment a little more than what you would in the previous case where excavation is possible uh, in an industrial site where they, uh, the uh, exposure is going to be something which is similar to occupational exposure as we talked about earlier. Okay. So, some of the logistical difficulties in in situ remediation is accessing the waste can be a problem as we saw in the previous site and uh, waste that can that is extracted must be treated on site. Um, and then we also have to take care of preventing uh, new exposure pathways. So, we try to create uh, solve one problem and in the process we create newer problems which are equal or greater in magnitude for exposure then we have a problem. So, uh, this is quite commonly the, uh, the criticism that comes to remediation uh, where people are overzealous in remediating something uh, and this is where risk assessment comes to uh, very important uh, use in making these decisions whether to do something or how to do something uh, and uh, 
the other uh, thing is it also gives us some uh, insight into into locating or siting of hazardous material processing away from residential zone. For example, we would definitely not want to have uh, an oil pipeline running below a residential area. So, with, with given that if you have it then we have to have safeguards in place where remediation is possible um, and this is something that one has to take care at the time of planning, at the time of urban planning this has to be um, done very judiciously otherwise there is going to be uh, uh, problems later on. So, this, is, this comes as part of the design and uh, so this is a very common problem because one of the things that we see is that 20-25 years back we have uh, industrial estates uh, 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 associated with cities which are far away from the city which are about 20-30 kilometers from the city. So, as the urban area the metropolitan area has grown in many of these cities now these industrial estates are surrounded by residential areas. So, the original design of segregating these places where the exposure to common public is minimized is now uh, not an option because uh, people have built houses around. So, either you have to re-engineer or retrofit these companies with safety equipment that uh, mat meets the standard for ambient exposure or they have to be closed and relocated elsewhere. So, uh, and this is a question that goes into urban planning and so we see this holistic approach uh, uh, that is necessary in order to do uh, anything uh, in our society. Now, we come to the issue of liability um, and the, the main uh, reason for liability is this remediation is expensive. So, if you can imagine if I have to excavate a thousand uh, uh, a very large amount of uh, uh, material and uh, this cost is going to be uh, prohibitive. So, who will pay for it? Uh, see, the general rule is that the polluter pays if the polluter is known. So, sometimes there are a lot of industries in a given area and we see contamination in the soil and uh, it is possible to track the polluter using what we call as environmental forensic tools which include analytical chemistry and the transport of pollutant. Uh, we saw some of it in the uh, previous uh, few lectures and if the polluter is known then we know sometimes it is it is very clear, um, but often times if it is uh, historical contamination which means that it has happened uh, several decades ago and the polluter is out of business or does not exist anymore and then others have to uh, get in and uh, industry or government have to come together to fund the restoration. Uh, one such uh, example of that is what is called a CER CLA in the United States or it is also called as a super fund, it is called a comprehensive environmental response uh, compensation and liability act and uh, a large number of sites have been where. Uh, so, this is a comprehensive, this is a fund that is uh, uh, that is created by the government with the industry and the community and then uh, they, they fund this common uh, this things. So, in this context we also look at remediation of contaminated sediments. Uh, um, so, contaminated sediment is something that is uh, there under water as we had uh, mentioned in the last lecture. And, uh, one of the cheapest options is to do what is called as a monitored natural recovery. In the, in the previous uh, few slides I had mentioned that sometimes if you if you find contamination in a given uh, site perhaps the one of the options is to leave it there because it, it may not cause as much damage to risk uh, health risk. If you leave it there and rather than disturb it and doing anything can sometimes be uh, worse than not doing anything. Uh, but this is not universally true and it is also a very uh, uh, uncertain, it leads to a lot of uncertainty and therefore the public cannot handle it. So, in this particular uh, option of what is called as a monitored natural recovery, we leave it alone, but we do not leave it alone, It we monitor what is going on, we monitor how much of chemical is coming out of the water, out of the sediment into the water and we hope that biodegradation will occur over a period of time and it, re it requires a realistic assessment of health risks and one cannot uh, uh, cut corners here because we are not doing anything with the hope that the, the measurement of concentration in the water is below the uh, limits of health risk limits uh, that we uh, estimate using toxicology tools. The public is usually not very comfortable with this option and that, that is one of the major reasons why people do not look at this. Uh, this is uh, an option that is very uh, uh, convenient and uh, easy for uh, the person, the the entity who is liable for uh, 
for cleaning up a particular uh, a waste site. So, the reason the public is not very comfortable is that there is always a possibility of release of the chemical by resuspension. The, if the mud in the in the sediment gets churned up for whatever reason and one of these reasons can be a storm. Uh, so, we see that once in a while we hear uh, a big storm, the storm of the century or storm of the decade that comes through and churns up sediment and takes big bunches of large sections of sediment and puts it downstream and uh, it churns up the water and the water gets contaminated and it can also go to the flood plain and the flood plains get con contaminated, soil gets contaminated and so on. So, a whole array of uh, secondary effects are triggered and therefore, people are not very comfortable. People are also not comfortable because there is a possibility of human intervention, you know, some accident and, uh, and therefore, uh, the other option people look at is uh, remedial capping or barrier. This is a relatively expensive in situ option, it is uh, not as cheap as monitored natural recovery because something has to be done. In this, in this case what we are doing is like a landfill, we are putting a barrier at least on the top. So, we are, we are covering up the contaminated zone so that it does not allow as easy of transport of the chemical into the water. We are putting a barrier on top of it and uh, the capping design is based on you know you can use different materials like sand or any engineered material uh, which have different properties and there is lot of these things have been done and this again is done on the basis of health risk because this this barrier will not last forever. So, it, it will get used up over a period of time it will get saturated and it will allow material to go through, but it may allow it at a very low rate and that low rate is probably sufficient to manage the health risk and this has to be again. Uh, based be, be uh, this has to be on the basis of a realistic assessment of health risk. Logistically, sometimes in uh, in in, a, in uh, certain areas you can use it without any problems. But some places, some places like navigational channels or harbors, it's difficult to put a barrier because this barrier will then obstruct navigation and therefore uh, can result in the destruction of the cap and and further damage. Uh, so, of course, there is always the possibility of this big storm coming and uh, destroying the cap and the sediment below. So, the third option is called as dredging. Dredging is the removal of the uh, contaminated sediment from the uh, site and re relocating. It is the most expensive option because it involves a lot of work and a lot of post processing. So, and it is an invasive process and therefore can result in other secondary effects. And so, we look at the small schematic here. Uh, dredging is done by a mechanical device which goes into the water, picks up the sediment and comes out and puts it somewhere. So, it is like a, it's like a, an excavator except that it is under water. So, you look at this animation, it goes in, uh, picks up the material and comes up and what happens in the process is when this happens, when you do this, it will result in a uh, resuspension of the sediment and the water can get dirty, really dirty and this is a secondary effect. So, in the first case you have left the sediment in there and it is contaminated, but the rate of release is certain, a certain value and it can cause a certain health risk. But by doing this, you may be increasing the health risk, both the air, air pollution and water pollution and therefore, this is a problem. So, this is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, if you do dredging, you have to be careful about adding on secondary effects. That is one problem. Secondary problem is the dredge material which you have removed now has to be kept somewhere and so this is again the same problem, not in my backyard problem. So, um, this is a, an issue that one has to take care of and while doing all this you have to again uh, worry about secondary pathways. Uh, for example, if I put it onto a barge and to a lorry or a truck and carry it somewhere it is open, you have to worry about closing it and uh, taking it somewhere and again depositing it somewhere where it is again likely to cause leaching and so there is a whole set of uh, other options that you have to look at. Okay. So, coming back to this uh, concept of liability, the um, when we talk about uh, liability, we are talking about a cost, we are talking about the cost that the, uh, the person who is responsible, the polluter uh, pays uh, philosophy. Uh, has to bear. So, so in, in the overall philosophy of liability, uh, if you do not want to have, people have liability because they have not taken due diligence in the process, in their original process where they, uh, they are supposed to have kept some safeguards and they are supposed to have done something right and they have not done it. 
So, uh, what we call as regulatory compliance. If you do not do regulatory compliance, you are liable to any damage that occurs to the environment. So, there are arguments that are placed. So, if you do this, maybe you would not have any liability. You do you, uh, you invest in pollution, ec uh, pollution uh, control equipment, you, you maintain all your uh, pollution equipment, uh, you, you take care of proper disposal uh, and cost of the administration and monitoring and auditing and everything correctly. If you do not do this, you have other costs which are not obvious straight away. You have of course, you are liable to damage, but then you are also uh, the uh, regulatory agencies try to monetize the lack of uh, regulatory compliance in these uh, categories that are listed in the in the right hand side. This is cost of workforce absence. So, in the case of safety for example, if you do not have safety equipment for uh, worker exposure, you can uh, it can lead to uh, loss of workforce uh, due to illnesses and all that and that is a cost to the company and it can also you can also lose an opportunity for recycling material. So, if you do not want to release it environment, one option is recycle it within your process and that is that's an added uh, benefit, an asset to the company and that is if you are not invested in that, then you lose the opportunity of doing that. You obviously have a cost of image. So, if somebody comes to know that you have a corporation is polluting and there is a lot of uh, media coverage and there is uh, a lot of campaigns against that corporation and this, this can happen, this we have seen it happen so many times. Uh, there is a cost of image and people go on uh, on record asking people to not to use certain products because it causes uh, uh, a certain environmental damage. Then you also have the cost of environmental damage itself in the sense this uh, there is uh, uh, some uh, contamination that occurs and that that is a cost. So, you have to pay that uh, the liability is directly linked to that cost of environmental damage Then the cost to community and these are all these are all Cost to community is a, is a vague thing, but uh, sometimes the community and the workforce is, is all the same. So, you, you will have some and there have been cases uh, in history where this has been very serious and that companies have gone out of business because of this because they have not thought about all these things uh, when they are designing uh, the, uh, the process. So, it is a combination of scientific, economic, legal and social aspects liability and uh, scientific is only one part of it. So, one of the things that people have to keep in mind is all these other things uh, when they are designing a process or a, or a product uh, in a particular corporation. So, in the next lecture we will review a case study in which uh, some of these issues will uh, again come up and you will see an application of this uh, coming up in a, in a, in a scenario uh, that you can relate to based on lectures that we have had so far. Thank you.